for our next Friends of GRI Surgery presentation during Women's Week, I have the pleasure of introducing my friend and colleague, Martha Quinn. Martha is continuing the long legacy of dedicated women who have worked in Glasgow Royal Infirmary. She has become an influential member of a team of surgeons who manage complex pelvic cancers. She serves as a mentor to many in the Department of Surgery and I have no doubt she will be an inspiration to many an aspiring surgeon in Glasgow and beyond. I hope you enjoy our talk today, Modern Surgery, the story of a surgical oncologist. Thank you for asking me to talk today. My name is Martha Quinn. I'm a consultant surgical oncologist at Glasgow Royal Infirmary and today I'm going to talk to you about it's surgery in the world today and a story of a surgical oncologist. So who am I? Um, I am a consultant surgical oncologist within Glasgow Royal Infirmary. I am also a wife. I am a mother of two young boys. Uh, I'm a daughter and I'm a sister uh, to an uh, older sister to uh, a sister that lives in London. And what do I do in Glasgow Royal Infirmary? Well, my practice is advanced um, surgical oncology. So that means dealing with advanced um, malignancy, mainly within the abdomen and pelvis. And that includes surgery for ovarian cancer, for gynecological malignancies. Um, I perform surgery called pelvic exenteration, which means removing all the visceral organs from the pelvis, sometimes with the entire pelvic floor and sometimes with a bone resection. I also am involved in um, surgery for sarcoma, both in the abdomen and helping the um, orthopaedic team with extremity sarcoma, um, and also deal with neuroendocrine tumour and advanced colorectal cancer. When I first uh, was given the invitation to talk at Women's Week, I thought, what can I say about women in surgery? And I googled women in surgery on uh, on Google and this uh, YouTube clip came up where they asked people to solve a riddle. And the riddle was a father and son are in a car accident. The father dies and the son is taken to hospital. In the operating room, a doctor came in and looked at the son and said, I can't operate on him. He's my son. Who is the doctor? Now, only 15% of people got this riddle right. The doctor is the mother. In the UK today, only 11% of consultant surgeons are female. And why is this? Why does surgery seem such an unattractive career for women? Well, it's probably due to views that are established years ago where surgery has seemed to, ha seemed to have a very rigid training structure and a poor work-life balance, and the hours are long and hard. But really, surgery is an exceptionally rewarding career. And today, I would like to tell you my story of how I survived and thrived and all the inspirational people I met along the way to get me to where I am today. So my story begins in Aberdeen. I was offered a place at Aberdeen University where I went for five years and graduated in 2004. I did my GHO years in Aberdeen and that was at the time where your, your house jobs were very important and if you wanted to be a surgeon, you had to do your surgical house job first in a good unit to get a good reference to get on to basic surgical training. So I did my house job in Ward 33 in Aberdeen and was successful in then gaining a place on basic surgical training in the north of Scotland. That took me to, um, to Aberdeen Royal Infirmary and the bottom picture with the bridge in the back is Ragmore Hospital in Inverness, where I spent six months of my training. I also went to Dr Gray's Hospital in Elgin um, and had a really good few years training in Aberdeen. Um, and then I was caught in the, the time period that was modernising medical careers. Um, or moving to Australia soon, as it was termed at the time. Um, I uh, didn't move to Australia um, and stayed here, and I was successful in gaining a place on the West of Scotland uh, Surgical Training Scheme. Now, 
at the time, that was a, a you know the largest training scheme in Scotland, and I had never trained in the west of Scotland at all, so it was all new for me. I didn't really know where to go. I was very fortunate where I spent the first two years of my west of Scotland training in Lanarkshire and in Paisley, and had an excellent couple of years. I was then sent to Gart Naval Hospital as an ST4. Now, I didn't really realise at the time, but usually that rotation was reserved for registrars at the end of their training. And I was really near the start of my training when I went. But that gave me my first taste of surgical oncology. Um, and really, I think that's where, you know, my true surgical oncology story begins. Um, shortly after my ST4 year in Garden Evil, I got married. And then just after that, baby number one came along. My husband is also a surgeon and he was just finishing his training at the time and was offered a fellowship in Adelaide in Australia as a vascular surgeon. So we decided that we would go away on fellowship and that I would take my maternity leave and spend it in Australia with him on his fellowship. So Fraser, my young, my eldest son was born in Adelaide um, and we spent nine months uh, out there um, as a as a, a mum um, in Australia. And it was a, a great time and my husband completed his fellowship and returned to his consultant job. And on return, I went back to the unit that I had left from. And that's really where the people who have influenced my career most start to come into play. So um, uh, Peter Chong is a consultant surgical oncologist that also works in the Royal. Uh, he did work in Gartnevo before the change of hospitals in in Glasgow. And he is probably one of the most influential figures in my career to date. Um, I remember a conversation that we had in his office about what I would like to specialise in and what type of surgeon I was going to be. Until this point, I really hadn't considered that I could be a surgical oncologist. But you know, Pete believed that that was something that I was capable of doing. And from that point, we really, you know, set about trying to structure my training so that I could achieve that at the end of my of my colorectal training. Um, John Anderson in the scrubs was um, the training program director at the time. And I had a long conversation with John about um, the type of surgery I would like to do and how we were going to achieve that over the last three or four years of my training. Um, I came back to training after my children uh, part-time, although I worked 80% of my elective uh, duties and then did 100% on call. And I did that for about a year when I actually realised that I would rather just train full-time. Um, it, it just worked better for me. Um, but there are many uh, female trainees and in the West of Scotland who have trained part-time and are currently appointed around the West of Scotland as consultants. Um, the woman in the picture is Ruth McKee, who's now retired. And I met Ruth when I came to the Royal for my ST seven and eight years. Um, Ruth really um, was quite legendary in surgery. She uh, was a female consultant in a, in a time period where there were very, very few female consultants. And um, she worked extremely hard, um, set a very high level uh, of what was expected and taught me to be a better surgeon. And for that, I will always be extremely grateful. Now, your last couple of years of training are um, a time where you go through an exponential period of growth in terms of learning what you can do and being able to become more independent. But... I wasn't content with one child, so I actually ended up having another baby at the end of my ST6 year. But things never go smoothly and there were bumps in the road. I had actually planned to do a higher degree at that point, but that, uh, that never came to fruition because my youngest child was born with a congenital cardiac defect and had to have surgery at six months to fix that. Um, that involved a period of inpatient stay at York Hill and then nasogastric feeding for him for till we got him to six months so he was large enough to have his heart fixed. Um, I remember phoning uh, Pete Chong from York Hill Hospital 
um, to explain that I wouldn't be back from my maternity leave when I had anticipated and telling him that I was in York Hill with Aaron um, who was needing open heart surgery and I've never seen so much support from a training programme as I got during that period um, and they were very flexible when I came back to work about being able to come back and still look after him. And so I attribute where I got to at the end of my training really uh, down to the huge amounts of support that I was shown from the people that I met along the way. But I finished training with a very large volume of cases in my logbook. And I had been very aware that if I wanted to do something that was really not in the colorectal syllabus and additional, additional to that really, that I had to finish training well ahead of the game. And I think that is true if you want to be a resectional surgeon in a high stake specialty. Um, you have to hit your milestones ahead of time and you have to make sure that you put yourself in a good position where you're competitive to be appointed. Um, so above my standard colorectal um, resections at the bottom of the slide are my multivisceral resections or my exenterations. So the radical pelvic surgery operations that I, was, that I did as a trainee. And I did 66 of these in my training. Now, a high volume centre in the UK for something like that would be classed as more than 10 resections a year. So I'd done pretty well by the end of my training, but still I wasn't really happy or content that I was ready to become a consultant. So this time it was my turn and um, I set up my fellowship in Sydney in Australia at this hospital, which is Royal Prince Alfred Hospital. It's a, a large, probably one of the largest public private hospitals in Sydney. But the reason for going was that it is the largest pelvic exenteration centre in the world. So I went away for a year to learn to take out all the pelvic organs together as one big package, but also to learn to take out parts of the pelvis that are tricky, like bone and um, the pelvic floor and the sidewall. So the sidewall in the pelvis is is very difficult because it has big large arteries and veins which are pretty ferocious and until about five or ten years ago people were told not to not to operate in there because the results were so poor but the centre really have, has pioneered that work and that's where I went on my fellowship. Now my husband came with me and my children came with me he took a sabbatical from his job um, but they actually had to go home uh, about three months in because things weren't really working for him on his sabbatical. So he took the children home and allowed me to finish my fellowship where I completed 10 months out of a year. Um, this is one of my mentors from Sydney, a man called Michael Solomon. Um, and uh, he, I still see him today at meetings. And if I ever wanted to discuss any cases with him, he would gladly give advice. Um, just in terms of volume, I did uh, 143 major resections while I was there um, and 44 of those were exenterations. So that meant I had finished my training by the time I was a consultant with 110 of those under my belt. Um, and also I did quite a lot of emergency surgery as well. So I did 55 emergency laparotomies in nine months. You need 100 to CCT over the entire course of your training in the UK. But there were other things that were important about being on fellowship. And really, it's a, you know, a once in a lifetime experience that you get to, you know, you get to build into your surgical training. Um, I was lucky because technically I've been on two, once as a mum and once for my fellowship. Uh, my kids still remember being in Australia. I met new friends and um, went for early morning swims with the, with the team. Um, and I think the, the large picture on the slide, um, the, there are three of my mentors in that picture and then the three women in the middle are the three fellows that were in, there, in uh, Royal Prince Alfred that year. And then I had some unforgettable experiences like climbing the Harbour Bridge on my last night in Sydney and uh, doing the Santa run around Sydney Harbour at Christmas time. So was my fellowship worth leaving my children at home for six months? It was honestly the hardest thing I've ever done, but probably one of the most rewarding things I've ever done. It taught me how to run a complex service. Um, I saw places in 
the body and in the pelvis that I really hadn't seen before. And I gained some independence um, and a different perspective. And I was ready to be a consultant when I came back to the Royal. So where are we now with surgical oncology in 2021? Well, Glasgow Royal Infirmary has an expanding unit of surgical oncology. Um, and I would say that amongst this, the consultants that work within that unit, and there's a large team who I will show you later on, we're probably as a group able to tackle most tumours in the abdomen and pelvis. Um, we do the largest volume of pelvic surgery in Scotland and are the largest sarcoma centre in Scotland. And in the last year, we have managed to accredit one of our fellowships with the ACP GBI and now have an advanced malignancy fellow. Um, and I think that due to the, the biology of tumours that we look after, we have a lot of transferable skills that translate into different branches of surgery. Um, and we help uh, get oncology on a regular basis and orthopaedic oncology. And this is a CT scan of the type of tumour that we would see. So the large mass in the middle of the abdomen is the tumour. And this really requires um, a different approach to what you're taught in your training. You have to think outside the box. There's no set piece for this type of surgery. Um, and that takes a different skill set from that of... Um, being able to um, you know, repeat st standard steps of an operation. Um, it takes experience. You have to have seen quite a lot. It, it takes training and training uh, uh, probably in a wider breadth than just as a colorectal surgeon or an upper GI surgeon. You have to have seen all these areas in the abdomen. Um, and you have to grow as a person. I, I, I think it, it does take a certain... Um, personality to want to do that type of surgery. Uh, all resections are different. So every single resection that we do is different. Um, this resection here needs um, a right-sided resection. So right up, right, right-sided block out, likely with a nephrectomy, probably with some colon. This is really difficult because it splays the great vessels and probably needs resection of the cava. This is a big pelvic mass and that needs an exenteration, so removal of all the pelvic organs. And this resection here is a big left-sided liposarcoma and that needs a left-sided block out. So the, the left-sided resections are easier than the right-sided resections. The organs on the left side of the abdomen are disposable. So the tail of the pancreas, the spleen, the colon, the kidney, you can live without those things. The right side is harder. You have the, the vena cava, um, the liver is, it, it is not really resectable um, or only partly resectable. Um, and the head of the pancreas is very difficult to deal with. This would be a sort of standard uh, CT that we would see for someone with a retroperitoneal mass or retroperitoneal sarcoma. Um, and that, that needs the right-sided organs of the abdomen resected. So this is the resection bed with the kidney and the colon away. What you can see at the top of the slide is the diaphragm, and this is the, the vena cava going through the abdomen, and this is where the renal vein has been taken to perform the nephrectomy. This is a large pelvic mass occupying the entire pelvis. You can see there's almost no visible bladder and no visible rectum separate from the mass, and this needs a pelvic exenteration, so it needs you to take all the organs out of the pelvis with the tumour in one go. And this is what the empty pelvis would look like afterwards. So these are the the iliac vessels, the artery and the veins going to the legs. This is an empty pelvis, so no, no uterus, um, no, no rectum, uh, no bladder. So the bladder is divided here. This is the vagina closed um, and the rectal stump closed in the middle here. And these catheters, these are the um, uh, umbilical catheters going up the ureters. So the ureters are divided and then they get replumbed into small bowel as an ileal conduit. So what does it take to perform these, um, these, this type of surgery? Well, I think what the most important thing is to realise that, you know, surgery is a team sport and surgical teams are stronger than any one person. This is our surgical team. Um, there are three general surgeons, Mr Chong, myself, 
Mr. Steele, who's our, our most recent appointment. Uh, this is Kerry Litchfield, our anaesthetist. Uh, Sanjay Gupta and Ashish Mahendra, who are orthopaedic oncologists. And then Professor Hart, uh, Stuart Watson and Stephen Lowe um, are our plastic surgery colleagues. And, um, you know, as a team, we work extremely well. But the, you have to realise that you can't do this alone and you need help. Um, so you can't bring your ego into theatre. This is going to take um, more than one of you to, to get these patients through. And it also takes a theatre team that believe in you. Um, these operations are high tariff, high morbidity surgery um, with the risk of significant blood loss. And the, the theatre team and the anaesthetic team need to believe that you are in control of that operation and that you can get yourself out of trouble or will phone a friend to help get you out of trouble. So where am I now? I'm four years into my post now. And where am I now? Well, I'm happy, maybe not as happy as this little man with his woolly mammoth, but I'm extremely happy working in a consultant team of three um, surgical oncolog uh, general surgical oncologists, so three general surgeons. We have three fantastic specialist nurses who support that service. And both myself and one of the specialist nurses have been sponsored by Macmillan. And that has opened the gateway for counselling and services for our patients, um, particularly because our population within the east end of Glasgow comes from quite a deprived population. And I think it's been very helpful um, to make sure that people are getting the support that they need. I regularly review um, papers for the British Journal of Surgery and for colorectal disease um, for a advanced kind of pelvic cancer. Um, and our unit is now involved in multi-centre uh, collaboratives um, looking at various aspects of, of uh, surgical oncology care. Um, I am the Scottish rep for the UK Pelvic Accentration Network um, and so far I've managed to successfully get two children to halfway to adulthood. Uh, hopefully they will be all the way there in another eight years' time. Um, it, this is the, the international collaboratives that we're part of and I put it up really to highlight that you know there are women in, uh, in this branch of surgery all over the world. Um, this is the uh, Transatlantic Retroperitoneal Sarcoma Working Group. Um, there's uh, women from uh, Canadian units, there's women from Australian units, there's people from MD Anderson in this picture. Um, this is the UK um, Pelvic Concentration Network. There's myself, Elaine Burns is in, in this picture from St Mark's. Uh, Kristen Boyle is here from Leicester. And then this is the um, worldwide uh, pelvic concentration uh, network called Pelvix. Um, and again, they have people from uh, people from Holland, people from Sydney, uh, people from uh, MSK. So, if I was going to leave some messages about being a surgeon and be, you know, being a young surgeon starting your career, what would I tell people about how to survive as being a young surgeon? Well, the first thing I would say is just be yourself, and. Girls, that means don't try to be one of the guys. You have two X chromosomes. Just embrace them and be yourself. Um, you know, there's nothing better than just being who you are. Surgeons are quite conservative people and first impressions count. So be organised, be efficient, you know, look professional, behave professionally um, and, and just work hard. One of my uh, things that I like to do, my, my junk TV watching, is I like to watch Grey's Anatomy. Um, and at the very first episode, Richard Webber says, this is your starting line. This is your arena. How well you play is up to you. Welcome to the game. The reality is that that's probably true. Um, how you behave, how, you, how, you, how hard you work, um, how, how you gain people's respect, that's up to you. But by all means you have something to prove so prove it and um you know you're there for a reason just just prove that you deserve to be there um what 
what I have tried to avoid in this talk and what I, one of the things that I think is unfair is gen gender stereotypes. Um, you know, men seem to be uh, good, uh, okay, or not good um, when it comes to surgical training. Um, but we will all have heard about female surgeons or the stereotypical female surgeons that are portrayed. Um, don't fall into any stereotypes. Just be the girl that is working hard, uh, doing her job, being efficient, being organised, and um, you know, and getting it done, kicking some, kicking some butt, and enjoy the company of men. You, you know, medicine will change. There are more and more women going into medicine. But at the moment, particularly in surgery, the workplace is quite male dominated. But enjoy the company of men. Men are quite straightforward. They're good to get along with and you can have a laugh with them. Um, you know, they're actually extreme. You know, all my all my colleagues are extremely good colleagues, male and female. Um, it does take a thick skin and um, you, it's bit, particularly in the busy specialties um, or in the, uh, you know, acute you know, acute receiving surgery um, in high volume units. Uh, you'll work hard, you'll think you've organised everything, but something will, you'll miss something, something will slip, you'll make a mistake. We all make mistakes. But just own up to your mistake and accept it and, you know, and move on. Um, you know, no cry no crying. Um, just, just get the job, just get on with things. Um, but one thing I would say is, um, you don't need to be mother. Everyone has mother. Um, you're there to do a job. You don't need to bake every day. You don't need to gather coffee. Um, don't fall into do to to that um, that pattern. And for everyone, you know, surgery takes endurance and it's long training. the The milestones that come during your training they come at very dif difficult points in your life where other life events are happening. You do have to be quite devoted to um, to being a surgeon um, and you have to be inherently tough to get through your training. Um, but choose wisely. You know, there are all lots of different branches of surgery. Um, I've chosen something very specific, um, but there are lots and lots of, of surgical careers that, you know, offer different perspectives and offer different things. So don't exclude those branches of surgery, um, you know, and keep your options open right until you need to make a decision. And then one of the last things I would say is, you know, find some balance in your life. Find find a way of of trying to do everything. You know, sure, you know, everyone thinks, oh, how, how can you do everything? But the reality is I couldn't have done all the things I have done up until now if I didn't have an extremely supportive partner. And he is also a surgeon uh, in an acute specialty. So, you know, the balance is difficult, um, but we try to get away when we can and find time for ourselves. Um, we like to kayak and spend time on the water. Um, I like to open water swim. Um, and one of the things I would say is that, you know, the thing that is most most important is time. So give yourself time. Um, give yourself time to, to have time with your partner. Give yourself time to have time with your family. Um, and... That might mean compromises elsewhere. Um, for for us, we don't go out for lots of, of fancy meals. We don't go on extremely fancy holidays. But we have a cleaner and a nanny and a gardener so that when I'm home, I can spend time with my family and I'm not doing those things. Uh, so this is the current uh, female general surgery consultant body in the Royal Infirmary. Um, with Carol Craig, Maria Coates and Fiona Leach. Um, and, you know, until a few years ago, there was uh, Ruth and Carol. So now there are four. So on behalf of the four of us for GRI Women's Week, we would like to say dream big, work hard and stay humble. Thanks.